What does Sally Field, Glennon Doyle, Gabby Bernstein, Marianne Williamson and Naomi Watts all have in common? Well, apart from being kick-ass women who have carved their name into the female empowerment badassery stone, they were all awakened to love through raw truth, radical healing and conscious action. And they all achieved this thanks to today's Women of Impact. All giving powerful testimonials for her new book, Revolution of the Soul, it's really no surprise that today's guest is getting global recognition for her work and mission. But every hero has a hero's journey, and a journey that consists of ups, downs and everything in between. From smoking cigarettes at the ripe old age of eight, to popping LSD and doing coke by 15, to showing up drunk to take her SATs. Yes, she would try anything to escape her crippling anxiety and escalating OCD. If she didn't walk in even steps, was someone she loved going to die? If someone touched her on the right side, her anxiety became all-consuming until she could get someone to touch her on the left. This overpowering mental disorder was more paralyzing than a sleeping body during REM. But through yoga and meditation, she finally woke up. Now an internationally acclaimed yoga teacher, public speaker and spiritual activist, she, through her company Off The Mat Into The World, teaches global humanitarian leadership training programs, covering everything from trauma to social justice issues. Honoured with the Conscious Humanitarian Award for her efforts around the HIV and AIDS crisis, as well as by the Smithsonian Institute for her ongoing commitment to yoga and activism, and as if all that wasn't impressive enough, she's been featured on the Today Show, NPR, Yoga Journal and Oprah.com, as well as graced over 27 magazine covers internationally. So please help me in welcoming the woman who's discovered there was no mountain pose she couldn't climb, the woman who discovered there was no warrior two she couldn't fight, and the woman who discovered that forward fold thinking was the key to gaining self-accountability and unlocking self-awareness. The revolutionary soul herself, Sean Korn. I'm Lisa Billiou, and I went from housewife to co-founder of the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize that you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. Thank you so Welcome much. Welcome to the show, my dear. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, <laughs> so in diving deep into your story, where I want to start is about self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And there's a quote that you actually have quoted, um, and it says, in order to see, you have to stop being in the middle of the picture. Mm -hmm. And that self-awareness is so powerful. Um, take me back to when you first became self-aware. So your past, you've been very open and honest about it, mm -hmm. um, how you were into drugs and things like that. At what point were you, did you become aware of how detrimental that was to you and then what you had to do to overcome it? Because um, OCD and anxiety, I'm mm -hmm. finding, is becoming even more prevalent in today's society. Sure. And so just thinking about how people can just initially start to identify mm -hmm. that. Well, when I, I wasn't, I didn't know I had obsessive compulsive disorder mm -hmm. when I was a child because it wasn't something that, um, A, my parents wouldn't have taken me to a therapist. Uh, we didn't come from that kind of an environment. You just kind of got over it. And uh, it just wasn't um, a diagnosis until later on. I knew I had quirky behaviors. They weren't unmanageable, but when I was uncomfortable, I would do things in patterns of fours or eights, whether it was blinking, swallowing, walking into walls. If someone touched me on one side, they have to touch me on the other side. And as long as I did these patterns, I would feel good in my body. If something happened in an odd number, and I was conscious of it, the anxiety, again, what I know today is being anxiety, would get worse and worse. And it was also um, coupled with superstition, mm -hmm. meaning that if I didn't do the patterns in certain ways, that I was always afraid that someone I loved would die or get sick, um, and that it would be my responsibility. And so it became very important that I patterned, is what I called it, to make sure that everyone around me sa stayed safe. And it was something that really depended on how elevated my stress mm -hmm. levels were. And, but again, I couldn't have known that, uh, understood that pattern. Is it the control factor? Is that what? Well, yes, of course. For me, it was, I dealt with, with as I write about in the book, I, I dealt with childhood sexual trauma at six years old. Mm -hmm. And it, my obsessive compulsive disorder began shortly after that. What had happened to me 
took agency from my body, from my voice, um, from my choice. And I recognize now that when I would pattern, I could create control around my body. It's the only thing I had. And it's the only thing I could do to make my body feel contained and feel safe. My patterning, especially in even numbers, was a way for me to create balance and harmony mm -hmm. in what I knew to be a chaotic world. And it was a very clever way to find safety in a body that was not safe. And so mm -hmm. I can see that now at that time, you know, I didn't recognize that at all. I just knew that I did these things. And like I said, it wasn't unmanageable. It got worse as I got, uh, as I hit puberty, as I became more sexualized, meaning that as I started to develop and got more attention sexually from men, it heightened the anxiety and my patterning would get worse. But it's in the same way, you know, when you experience trauma, there's a, um, a, a bio, there's a biochemical response, meaning you have a traumatic experience, chemicals released from the brain, they flood into your body, and you're put into fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. And in my case, it was freeze and dissociation is what mm. happened to me. And in the moment of trauma and the chemicals releasing into your body, there's a contraction that happens in order to create a sense of safety. So the body contracts, and in that moment, that trauma has been imprinted in the cells. So as I get older, that contraction, that tension actually feels safe. Anytime that there's a release of that tension, I don't know what's on the other side of that tension. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence that mm -hmm. it's a good thing. And so my big feelings, when tension would start to release, big feelings would come up. And in life, when big feelings come up. If we don't know how to manage them, we might turn to food or sex or drugs or alcohol or the internet or shopping, whatever it might be, to anesthetize or numb out from the bigger feelings. I didn't have access to that when I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. So patterning became my drug mm -hmm. of choice. It made me feel better in the same way a drink might or drugs might. For a split second, it helped to diffuse the emotion that was the core of that anxiety. And so when I moved away from home and away from my support system, especially my mother, my anxiety got worse and my patterning got worse. But at this point, I'm now doing drugs. But I also simultaneously was able to discover yoga and meditation and therapy. And I straddled two worlds for a while. One world where I had access to all the drugs and alcohol that I wanted or needed and the other world where I was being introduced into these different ideas. And so thankfully, one side took over mm -hmm. more and it helped me to pull out of some of those habits before they became chronic. When you say thankfully, what do you actually mean? Because I think that that's very deliberate on your part, right? You made that choice. You had the strength to let go of the drugs and the alcohol and turn to mm -hmm. yoga and more holistic approaches. Um, how did you decide to lean more towards the yoga? Like what was that, um, that mechanism or that, that process? Well, I think I say thankfully because I was so young. I mean, mm. I moved away from home, like I said, eight, at 17. I had already started doing drugs uh, way earlier on, um, and I liked them. I had no issue with drugs at all. Mm. One of my first jobs in New York City happened to be at a cafe on the Lower East Side called Life Cafe. Life Cafe was owned, it was owned by a man named David Life, and uh, who went on to open Jiva Mukti Yoga, which is one of the most premier yoga uh, schools in the world. And so it's like, I feel like now, it's like the universe conspired to put me in environments that was just whispering my ear, um, challenging me to pay attention. And the choice was mine, like I, either way, but the fact that I had the option, mm. the fact that this information was being handed to me, that was something, that's what I'm thankful for because mm. especially at that time, uh, these all, alternative uh, ideologies, philosophies, practices were incredibly foreign. They're not as mainstream as they are today. Right. And so considering I had many friends at that time in the same cafe, 
many of them are dead today. They had the same awareness, the same opportunity, mm -hmm. the same environment. And for whatever reason, drugs, alcohol um, drew them in and they weren't able to take this wisdom and apply it. Somewhere within my subconscious, I did not want to die. I wanted to live a richer, deeper, more meaningful life. I just didn't know what that meant. Mm. Um, I wanted access and tools to become more aware, but I didn't know what that meant. I was drawn towards uh, alternative thinking and yet still deeply steeped in my old ways of understanding, the old patterns, my upbringing, all of that. And it was just getting on the mat. At first it was just purely physical. Mm -hmm. There was nothing about it that was spiritual to me, not in the least. I did not believe in God. I resisted the notion I of say God. you were atheist, yeah. right? Um, but what happened was I practiced and the drinking didn't feel good. And I practiced and the drugs didn't feel good. And then the cigarettes didn't feel good and the meat didn't feel good. And then one, just one thing after another, it just didn't feel right in my body. I didn't want to do these things. Mm -hmm. Something else was being replaced. Mm -hmm. Now I hadn't gotten to the core of my wounding yet, not even close, mm -hmm. but yoga and meditation and pranayama breathing techniques, they were helping me to self-regulate mm -hmm. and not need to want to anesthetize myself with drugs or alcohol. It allowed me to stay a little bit more present to my big feelings without being overwhelmed by them. Mm -hmm. And in time was able to learn uh, skills to help me to at first just manage my obsessive compulsive disorder, help me to manage the anxiety and in time help me to understand how the anxiety got there in the first place because mm -hmm. that's key. It helped me to move through the anger, which was why, which was what drugs and alcohol were trying to mask so that I can get to what was underneath the anger, which was grief. Mm -hmm. And no amount of anything can um, heal you uh, more than really connecting with your deepest vulnerability because that's the access point to surrender and surrender is what opens us up to God. Yeah, um, I wanna talk about that first step into yoga because I heard you say that it actually caused you more anxiety initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what allowed you to keep going? Because if mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, I've got anxiety and I go do yoga, I just try mm -hmm. it out and it actually heightens it. Yeah. My instinct, right, is to run. Yeah. It's like, I'm never doing that again. That makes it worse because I think that people do that. They want um, to play it safe, to feel secure, to feel safe. Yeah. So what kept you going mm -hmm. and actually explain how it gave you more anxiety and then sure. take me through the steps. Well, as a teacher, I watch it all the time. And what students don't often understand is that it's part of the process, the mm -hmm. discomfort. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of the, the, their own personal evolution. They can't get to the other side of it until they go through it. So teachers would say things like, focus on the sensation. So I started to notice that my anxiety has a sensation attached to it. My heart would beat fast. My face would get red. My breath would get really short. I'd feel hot. I'd feel fidgety. Those were sensations that let me know that I'm having anxiety. It's like, okay, I can, I can be with that. And so breathing and self-regulating was the way in which I was able to manage the impulse, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. I had to find <laughs> out where, what was the core of it. Now, of course, the core was trauma. Yeah. I didn't associate myself with someone who had trauma, um, but I did. And this was the way in which my particular nervous system responded to it was by going into this energetic lockdown and dissociating, disconnecting from my body and needing patterning as a way to feel in control. And so it was, uh, I kept going to yoga. I kept taking more and more classes because it was helping me to manage the OCD and then therapy helped me to understand its core. Mm. So take me through the unraveling then of the trauma because recently I had a guest on and it blew my mind because I always think of trauma as being very big, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you've been sexually abused, you've been um, kidnapped, I mean like yeah, massive, yeah. massive things. Um, so I never thought of like myself as having trauma or yeah. really other people that I know like having trauma and they broke it down yeah. and I, I heard you say the same thing as like everyone has some form of trauma. Yeah. So talk to me about you discovering that you had trauma and how yeah. other people at home can start to identify that. 
Trauma is anything that overwhelms our capacity to cope and leaves us feeling helpless, hopeless, out of control, or unable to respond. What might be traumatic for me might not be traumatic for you at mm. all and vice versa. Bullying, death of a loved one, um, uh, uh, divorce, these are traumas that can have a huge impact, especially when you're a child. Mm. So there's shock trauma. Those are those usually one-offs, those unimaginable moments that just pull the rug right out from underneath you. But developmental trauma is different. And all of us experience it. And it's usually when we don't have the words to express our big feelings. Mm. You see, emotion is, um, everything is energy. You know, Energy is defined as vibration with information but there's subtle energy. And subtle energy you cannot see, but you can feel. Love, joy, mm -hmm. these are subtle energies. But so is shame, fear, rage, guilt, grief, what they call the shadow emotions. So when you experience trauma, there's always going to be a shadow emotion that's attached to it, uh, usually many of them. So you experience this trauma, bullying, you know, you're, in, you're ashamed, you're angry, you're afraid. Remember that what I said before, it's like your, your, your brain releases chemicals, you go into fight, flight, freeze, uh, or collapse, there's that contraction. If you were raised in an environment where your parents recognized, or who's ever raising you, recognize like, okay, there's been, uh, this, this child is overwhelmed, um, they look like they might be in shutdown, uh, let's give them a space to express those big feelings. Maybe they pick up a tennis racket and they beat a pillow. Maybe they journal write and use whatever language they want. They let the animal energy out of them. When they do that, they discharge the energy and they're able to get to what's underneath the rage and the fear and the shame, which is grief. Most people weren't raised in that kind of an environment. This is what might happen. You know, big feeling comes up and parents said, oh God, you're, 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 you're sad or you're scared. Here, have a cookie. <laughs> or you're angry, come on, let's go shopping, I'll oh, buy you a little you're present. You're fine, yep. mm -hmm. worse has happened. Yes, and, or I'll give you something to be sad about. Right. And, and so what, what they're taught is to suppress mm -hmm. it. So you take that anger, you take that rage, you take that shame and you suppress it into the body. That suppressed emotion, it becomes tension, mm. that contraction. Tension, stress, and anxiety are the number one causes of illness and depression. And because of my childhood trauma, I was always like waiting for the next shoe to drop. Mm. And so my body was waiting for the assault. It was waiting for the insult. Mm. It was waiting for the abuse. So if it happened, I wouldn't be taken by surprise. So any time after that, whatever child has that trauma, the next time they're bullied, or an event happens that in the subconscious makes them feel like that original event, mm -hmm. they time travel. They're right back there, all right? Their body contracts. That tension is cumulative and it's addictive because the sensation of that tension feels safe because mm. they don't know what's on the other side of it. it to them, it's, it's, it's actually liberation. There's just no evidence to that. So it's easier to stay in that tension. As a result, Anger has to come out some way. It has to, it, it, it's a living thing. So that child grows up, they've got this tension, they meet you on the street, you say something to them, and suddenly they react. Because in that moment, you may have said something that hurt their feelings, mm. even if it was deliberate or not. Because they're not in present time, they've time traveled to the original assault, their body is letting them know that danger, danger, now they're, an, that now they're an adult, so they have a choice. And that choice, more often than not, is going to be re, to react. They'll meet fear with fear, they'll meet rage with rage, hate with hate. And that's how we have just this, this cycle of dysfunction that happens. When you practice yoga, you stretch. And when you stretch, you release the tension. So what happens is the emotion that has been living has been a part of that tension, begins to rise to the surface. Thus why, when people come to yoga, they fidget, they look around, they fantasize. They don't have access to the food, the sex, the drugs, the alcohol on the mm -hmm. mat. All they have is their thoughts, and they use them as a way to avoid 
the big feelings that actually need to arise. So essentially, what, what needs to happen for us to heal as a society is to recognize that we're all in trauma, that we've been taught to suppress our big feelings, that our big feelings are considered bad, wrong, shameful, or ugly, and that there are tools that allow us to excavate those feelings so that we can be in the presence of them. And if we can, then in the face of conflict or crisis, instead of reacting, I can respond, meaning I can ground, breathe, self-regulate, notice really quickly like, oh, my chest is tight. My, my heart is beating. I want to rip her face off. Mm -hmm. probably, probably not an appropriate response to what's happening here all right, I'm not in present time, breathe. Then maybe I can make a more compassionate and empathetic choice rather than escalating conflict because of my own unhealed woundings. Mm -hmm. So that in a nutshell wow. <laughs> is trauma. It never um, dawned on me. So before we were rolling, I was actually telling you that I used to think yoga was woo woo. I mm -hmm. was that person that thought I knew everything. Science is everything. And, you know, like the spirituality of other things is just a way of making money until my health kind of basically fell apart four years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I explored everything, Western medicine, and nothing was helping until I started looking into the more holistic, like yeah. yoga and things. And that's when things changed for me. And my very first yoga session, I had and I told my teacher my what I'd been through and how sick I'd been for so many years and so she did something super like stretching mm -hmm. and by the end I cried of course, and yeah. I'm not a crier yeah. and I in the moment I was looking and I was like I don't know what like it wasn't that I was feeling that like sad I wasn't mm -hmm. feeling sadness and that was what was weird I mm -hmm. was just like my it was like a um, someone had opened a valve yeah. or something and I never understood why. The body remembers everything. Yeah. There's no separation between the mind and the body. You were focused on the belly, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's third chakra. And third chakra is, this, is the magnetic core of our personality and our ego. It's the place in our body where we house our sense of self mm -hmm. and our soul. When we have a strong sense of personal spiritual identity, we never have to look to the physical world for validation mm -hmm. or definition. We just know who we are. But because we're in human form, very often our sense of self is determined by the way we look, the money we have, the relationship that we're in, um, all these things that are temporal. They can, you know, relationships change, money comes and goes. Um, so if our sense of self is dependent on things that change, we're always grasping for more and more. So when you're doing work to heal this part of your body, you, you can, of course, you want to do, you want to change your, your diet, you want to do the practices, and you want to look to where you're holding narratives within mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. consciousness that in some way is there, that idea of not enoughness. Right. And so what yoga does is it brings it up. So those tears aren't present time tears. Mm -hmm. you're, those are the tears of your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Those are the tears of all the women who have given power away. And to me, that that's when yoga gets good. It's hard, because that's when most people will quit. Because they're like, well, why? I came here to get blissed out. Right, right, right. You can't change it until you see it. Yeah. So when you have those incredible moments, it's like you've been given an incredible gift to go in. And I, I imagine you felt a little better afterwards. I did, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought up narrative, by the way, because um, I think we all have a narrative that we play in our heads. Yeah. Um, and the narrative we all play in our heads feels true. Yes. Um, but that can hold us back. Yeah. So how would you unravel that? Um, so through yoga, I know that mm. you said it wasn't just like a one-time thing, right? It's like no. 15 years of exploring. Um, what are those key things that people can take away, though, in knowing, like, identifying what their narrative is, yeah. is whether it works for them or against them, and yes. then how they can change yeah. it? It's really important to understand that we are not our stories. Yeah. They are aspects of our experience, and all of us have different elements of it, and they're intense, and they're juicy, and they're boring, and they're perverse, and they're unique to each soul. Mm -hmm. And yoga is about relationship. It means to come together and make whole. It recognizes that everything is connected. So for me to understand the light, I also have to be in relationship with the shadow. And our narratives give us incredible opportunity to connect with the shadow. 
where we get stuck is we start to believe we're that story instead of seeing a bigger spiritual picture to why things have happened as they do. Mm -hmm. now, I look back at my childhood trauma and I wouldn't have wished that on anybody. That was a drag. I had to do a lot of work around that, but I can't change that. Mm -hmm. And had I not had those challenges, anyone who's watching, that our challenge, our pain is our purpose. It's what will bring us to our knees and then uplift us towards grace. It just takes time and practice and a willingness to reframe the incomprehensible and to give it meaning and value. But it doesn't mean bypass. You can't get to the bless you until you go through the fuck you. <laughs> and that fuck you's gotta go somewhere. So if it stays in the body, it'll come out sideways in a, in a different way, either through um, inappropriate behavior or even attitudes, sarcasm, you know, you know, shut down, um, minimizing someone else's power or potential because of your own feeling of inadequacy. And so we want to be able to uh, be in relationship with both the, the shadow self mm -hmm because it's through the shadow that we're going to be able to understand the lesson and the lesson that's going to open our heart to love. And the more I can love myself, the more I'm going to be able to stand in the presence of another soul mm -hmm. and recognize they're doing the best they can with what little they know based on their own trauma and the lack of tools that they had available to them, that they too are here to open to love. Mm -hmm. And the rate in which that happens is actually not my business, that they are not their story, yet their story is informing their destiny. And the most important thing I can do is stay on my side of the street and do my work on myself mm -hmm. and recognize, try to reframe why things have happened and to see the value and the opportunity rather than just the, um, the dysfunction mm -hmm. and the pain and suffering. But you gotta feel the pain, you gotta feel the suffering, and then you transcend. Yeah, I love that so much. It so resonates with me. Yeah. And um, it was really impressive when I heard you say that you started to recognize your own ignorance and realizing that you're white privileged. Mm -hmm. And so that forced you to start looking at the other side, at different races, different sexualities. Take me through that and what yeah. lessons you learned. I found that so mm -hmm. powerful. Well, spirituality is really interesting that way. It's just when you think, you, you start to figure this stuff out these curveballs come in and what happened is after uh after I, I went through my you know my own healing process around my own trauma and forgiveness like i said it became very important to me to be in service and i thought well abundance is coming in to keep abundance going you got to push the abundance out mm -hmm. so eh, i should probably help someone that's how cavalier it was mm -hmm. not realizing that the moment I walked into an environment where there was trauma and pain and suffering, I was being initiated into the next level of my own healing because now I'm meeting in face-to-face -face examples of my own shadow self. And I had this idea that, oh, we're all one because that's what yoga teaches us. Mm -hmm. But my next big lesson was we might be one, but we're not the same. And until I can acknowledge those differences, I'm the problem because I'm ignoring what's directly in front of me and my complicity in that suffering. So my foray into service was white saviorism. That's how it showed up at first. Like I was the savior, like I'm gonna fix this. I didn't even understand what it was I was fixing. So the next big part of my journey was having to confront power and privilege and the ways in which someone who looks like me internalizes racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ageism, ableism, um, bias, discrimination. I can't not be any of those things. I have to be because I was raised in an environment that was all those things. So overtly, I might walk through the world, you know, and say, well, I'm not racist, but put me in a situation where I get afraid and the primal part of my brain um, uh, gets activated, that reactive part of my brain, mm -hmm. suddenly I'm not in present time. I'm my grandmother again. Mm -hmm. I'm my high school again. And so the book really explores the ways in which we internalize um, as tension 
these these ways in which we create separation mm -hmm. and that the only way that we can heal it is own it. Mm -hmm. Being racist isn't the isn't necessarily the issue. Again, we're all going to hold some form of bias, prejudice, discrimination. The problem is not owning it, is acting as if somehow we're beyond it, then nothing can change. The moment I can say, yes, of course I'm racist, is the moment that we can begin to heal it, is the moment that when it shows up, it's like, oh, there it is in my body. Let me breathe. Let me take a different choice. So to me, it's normalizing the conversation and looking at it spiritually and trying to see the bigger picture once again so that we don't create more suffering, so that we don't create more harm. Because when I say we are one, I want to mean it. And I want to take ownership for what that means and my responsibility to it. And in the practice, we're taught that our liberation is bound, that I can't be free unless we're all free. Mm. So I have to look at the ways in which I prevent freedom, and I do. The ways in which I'm complicit, complicit or participate in the, uh, in the separation that creates that suffering. So if I want to dismantle the systems that exist, uh, whether it's on a governmental level, on a, you know, a systemic level, I have to dismantle the systems that exist within myself mm. first. And those systems run very deep and they're uncomfortable, they're humbling, they're embarrassing, and they're essential. If we wanna change the world, this is how we do it. We take accountability for our, the way in which we participate in creating that harm. Mm. How do you actually do that then? Because <clears throat> we all have a perspective. So even if you're identifying things within yourself, your perspective may be telling you that that's right or that that's okay mm -hmm. how do you even break how do you break that wall just work just doing the deep work reading the books mm. going to therapy being in conversation really looking inward noticing your fragility around it or your defensiveness mm. around it and so it's it's diligent hard work and it's work that i hope anyone who's who says they want peace who wants freedom for all who talk about this world um, wanting to make the world a better place I hope that they challenge themselves to recognize their own participation in this dysfunction and change that behavior um, because the systems are just made up of people. Mm -hmm. Change the people, we change the system. Mm -hmm. Because of systemic oppression would literally be jailed, killed, doing this. Our privilege has made us exempt from that. Mm -hmm. So how dare we not have these conversations? Mm -hmm. How dare we not be uncomfortable in these conversations? How dare we not go deep when we can? Lives are at stake. And what our privilege gives us is the bandwidth to be able to dig even deeper into that uncomfortableness so that we can actually create an environment of safety for others um, because of the, our own work, because of the path in which we're forging. And so, you know, anyone who's out there like, well, what can I do? Like, do your inner work mm. and hold yourself accountable and normalize these uncomfortable conversations and be willing to confront the limiting beliefs that are within you that are keeping you stuck and forgive yourself for thinking you should know better and let yourself become more empathetic. Then when you meet the perceived other, you're not as quick to want to tell them what they need to do. Mm. You're not as quick to judge you recognize like, man, they are in their humanity right now. And my job is to love them no matter what, meet them there no matter what. But I can't do that unless I'm doing my own work. Mm. That includes the messy work. So how do you, if you've done your work and you're meeting someone and you just see blatant racism, how mm -hmm. do you meet them there when oh, you've done yeah. the work to overcome that, to realize that's not the right way to approach this, yeah. to recognize that that could be so detrimental to the world? Yeah. How do you meet them there? If you're safe, like if you're in a situation right. where you know you're physically safe to call someone up, um, you call someone up. I would have to imagine in my life, most of the people are well-intentioned mm. and, and saying racist things. Do you actually things. believe that then? In my core, I'd have, the only way to approach a conversation with someone is to hold them that they're well-intentioned. If, yeah. if I was, if someone said something that was racist, and I just was like, you're racist. They're gonna say, no, I'm not. And then conversation over. Right. Whereas if I could find a way to soften the dialogue mm. and say, you know, you're an amazing person and I've seen you do so many great acts of kindness. I'm not sure you're aware, but what you just said, that could really create harm. And if you're open to the conversation, I'd love to share with you why that would create harm. Mm. 
and see if there's a doorway in. Usually I would share with them my own story. I always try to put it on myself. Yeah. Here's what I, this is what I did. Or God, just yesterday I said this thing and you know, that's kind of a microaggression. Like it, you and I, it might not be a big deal, but to that person, they may have heard this 10,000 times in this month and it's just eating at their body, reminding them that society believes them, perceives them to be less than. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, is that, that I, I don't believe that would be your intention. And if they're open again, they'd be like, no, I don't wanna do that. And see if you can start that dialogue. But if I approach it with judgment, or as if I know better, mm. it's dead. And I'm not enlightened, we're not enlightened. We're gonna be messy this whole journey. And, but maybe perhaps the awareness changes so that I can own it. Maybe the next time I say something that actually does hurt someone, even if it was, ah, no big deal, they know what I meant, you know, they know that, you know, that I'm a lover. Mm -hmm. Maybe instead I'll be like, ooh, like I'm sorry. I, I think I just created harm. Mm -hmm. Shit. There's a gap, like you catch it quicker. Doesn't mean you don't do it, mm -hmm. but you catch it and then you take ownership for it. Mm -hmm. That's progress. And that's right now for me, as a white woman who is a social justice activist, the best thing that I can do is take accountability, normalize these conversations for other people who are part of this dominant culture and invite them into their own inquiry about what lives in their body, mm -hmm. what has been normalized, how have they benefited from that, how is it convenient, and if they really wanna change the world, this is what it looks like. And it's, uh, it's harder than just writing out a check. It's, it's mm -hmm. deeper. And um, there's not a lot of models for it, but I believe in my soul that that is what's gonna shift this needle. I mean, it's what's happening in our world. Our world is in trauma right now. So what's happening? Fear is meeting fear. Rage is meeting rage. And that's why we're seeing this explosion. The good news is, if we can survive, What's being excavated on such a, a big level is the same thing that's within us. So now we're being forced to have to look at it and you can't change it until you see it. We're seeing it, now we have to take responsibility and change it. And that's actually, I'm so glad you said that because when it all started like kind of excavating, as you say, um, I was like, where's this coming from? Yeah. And clearly it's A, a world I just am not a part of and B, it really is, it's just been hidden it's yes. been buried it didn't mean that it didn't exist yeah and that to be honest was the most scary thing for me yes yes because I was like how have I been oblivious this whole time that this amount of you know racism and things like that exist in the world yeah, yeah. and then I was like god am I just naive and you know and then you start to but kind that's of, that's privilege yeah. we don't yeah we right that, and and we like that it's like I don't I don't not, that doesn't right. affect me yeah. that's not going to hurt my bottom line my survival and yet people on the margins, they've been experiencing this for eons. They're looking at us mm -hmm. like, oh, welcome to the party. Right, right, right. Like, thanks for finally noticing, yeah. but this is what we've been living with. And I've got to feel it in the same way I felt my, my personal trauma. I've got to get comfortable with this ancestral cultural trauma and try to make sense of it so that I don't continue it in future generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your book is fantastic. Your message is amazing. I love that you're giving tactical things about how to do it and you're giving your own experiences. And I really think that makes such a difference because, you know, we like if we see someone that has been through it and can get through it, it gives us that credibility. We're like, oh, maybe yeah. I can too. Right. So um, what is the thing that you hope for people take away though the most from the book? Like what is that? They could take away one thing. Um, my hope is that it, inspires them to recognize that all of us are here to love bigger than we ever imagined possible and to awaken to that love and be in service to that love and the gift of this life that we have, is sh which is so short, mm -hmm. is that we can serve this world towards peace through our own actions, words, and deeds. And this has nothing to do with the size or shape of your body, your age, the color of your skin, your sexuality, your gender. It has everything to do with that part within your soul that knows that we're connected and that we have a responsibility to love each other into peace and that we've all been called mm. and that the time is now for all of us to wake up and do what needs to be done in order to create a world that is free and fair and safe and equal and just for all beings everywhere. And my hope that what people get from this book is it inspires them 
to recognize their own inner power and the gifts that we have to heal, the resiliency that we have to reframe our narr narratives, the wisdom that we can cultivate to actually forgive ourselves for thinking that we should know better and forgive others for the same thing. And that as we move towards wholeness, that the true wholeness is when the individual becomes a part of the collective. Mm -hmm. And that this book uh, awakens people into what could be possible if we open our hearts to love in that way. I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of inner power, what is your superpower? I would have to say my superpower would probably be my intuition. Mm. I've always been incredibly intuitive. Um, and our self-esteem is directly attached to our intuition. We're downloading information at every single moment. We always know exactly what to do because God is within us. It's not something you seek. It's something you awaken to. So I always know exactly what is needed, even if it's going to cause me discomfort and pain, that it's part of my own evolutionary process that's moving me into my awakening. But if I have low self-esteem, I can't trust my inner guidance. Mm -hmm. I'll second guess it. I'll ask my mom. I'll ask you. Um, I'll modify it so that I can feel comfortable, so that I don't feel like I'm gonna get hurt. But when I call that power back and have a resonance with God in that way from within, then when I get those hits, I might be like, ah, fuck. But I'll know exactly what needs to happen next and I will surrender to it and it's never wrong. And it will always open me up not just to love, you know, love of self, but love of society. Mm. And so, Intuition is not a gift, it's a skill. It's one we develop. And so I'd have to say my superpower is my intuition. I love mm -hmm. that. And so where can people find you and the book and all of that good stuff? Yeah, um, seancorn.com Sean, Sean, is uh, where they can find me. Uh, if they go to revolutionofthesoul.com, they can download the first chapter, which is a really potent chapter about really about understanding God. Um, and where I found God in an all-male gay sex club in New York City back in the 80s. <laughs> I love that story. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so they can download that chapter for free. They also can get seven videos, uh, little teaching videos for free also. And um, they also, if they want to know more about um, Off the Mat Into the World, uh, which bridges the gap between yoga, transformational work, um, social justice, and conscious action, they can go to offthematintotheworld.org and check out our leadership trainings there. Amazing. Mm -hmm. We'll drop all those links in our Thank comments you. below. Um, guys, guys, you've got to go check out this book. Mm -hmm. I love that she put like revolution, evolution. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, go check this out, guys. Check out all the stuff that she's doing. It really was, especially because I'm going through my own journey, it really was um, an eye opener for me as well. So check her out, check out the book. And if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed, this episode has brought you value, guys. Click that subscribe button down there. And until next time be the hero of your own life peace out thank you what up guys lisa here thanks so much for watching this episode and if you haven't already subscribed click that little button right in front of you click 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 away we release episodes every wednesday so be sure to get notified till next time go be the hero of your own life